one. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Kings 17, if you want to open there. So we're going to talk about the accounts of the two widows, one in Elijah's day, one in Elisha's day. We'll spend most of our time on this, on the first widow. <clears throat> um, we'll get, hopefully we'll get to the last widow uh, toward the end. Uh, before we do, let's go to our Father in prayer. God in heaven, we praise your name. Thank you so much for sending Jesus, the innocent lamb who died on our behalf. We believe him. We believe Jesus was innocent, that he was the payment for our sins. And we are so grateful that we were able to enjoy that wonderful fellowship around the table with you this morning. We're so grateful that we can open your word and just have life given to us as we read and study. And we pray, God, that we'll honor you as a result of this study. That it'll help us learn to be better disciples and to trust you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here in 1 Kings 17, we meet the prophet Elijah for the very first time. And in order to really appreciate why God sends Elijah, we need to set this chapter in context. This is in the divided kingdom period after the, you have Israel in the north and then the kingdom of Judah down south. And the king over the northern kingdom of Israel at this time is Ahab, and he is just awful. And we get a little interesting verse about him in 1 Kings 16, verse 31. It says there in verse 31 in chapter 16, it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went to serve Baal, and worshiped him. So it's bad enough, King Jeroboam was the first of the, the kings of the northern kingdom, and he was just awful. He changed the, the place of worship. He made up his own priests, and basically all the evil kings after Jeroboam got compared to Jeroboam. So, well, so-and-so king was just as wicked as Jeroboam. Well, with Ahab, it's like, yeah, he was just as wicked as Jeroboam, but on top of that, he was also did this really ridiculous thing of going and uh, marrying this foreign woman named Jezebel, and her father's name is Ethbaal, which means Baal is with him. And Ahab starts worshiping Baal. And what we'll find out later is that Jezebel, uh, she is a murderous psycho, <laughs> and she does not like this idea that the Israelites are worshiping Yahweh and Baal. She wants to make it to where Baal is the only one being worshipped. And anybody who worships Yahweh is to be hunted down and killed. And so, because of Jezebel and Ahab's influence, uh, Baal worship becomes the national religion of Israel, which is just absolutely astounding because of the history of Israel, right? They, they're only a nation because God made them a nation. He rescued them from Egyptian slavery. He provided for them in the wilderness. He gave them the promised land, the land of Canaan, which, by the way, was Baal's territory, which should already tell the Israelites that God is more powerful than Baal. They still forgot about Yahweh. They didn't care about him. They didn't love him. They didn't want to obey him at all. And so now they're now the Israelites have really messed up because they have angered Yahweh, the one true God, and it's time for God to step in and show his people that he is the one true God and not Baal. And it amazes me because God could have just killed all of these people and nobody would have been able to blame him for it because he warned them about this in the covenant. You know, you start worshiping idols, you abandon me, you know, you de it's death for you. But God is patient, he's loving, he's kind. And so instead of just killing them on the spot, which he could have done, he sends Elijah to them to show them signs, to show them miracles, to give them a period of hardship as discipline so that they will wake up and they will see, hey, we need to come back to our God. Don't let anybody tell you, the, well, the God in the Old Testament, he's a mean God. You know, he just killed everybody on the spot. With no, and that's not true at all. He's so patient, he sends Elijah. And Elijah's name means Yahweh is God. In other words, Baal is not. <laughs> So look in verse 1 
Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely there shall, uh, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Now in order to fully appreciate what's happening here, you need to know Baal was the storm god responsible for sending rain upon the land. And of course, it didn't rain all the time. And so Baal worshipers, they had this idea that, okay, yes, Baal sends the rain. But in the times that he doesn't send the rain, that's because he is being temporarily defeated by the god Mot, or the god of death. And then there's another god named Anat that comes along and rescues Baal, sets Baal free, and he is resurrected from the dead, essentially. And then he sends rain again on the land. Well, what God is doing here is he's showing people, I'm the one who sends rain on the land, not Baal. And he's showing that Baal is not submitting to Mot, the god of death. Baal is submitting to Yahweh. And when Yahweh puts you to death, there's no resurrection. Right? You, he, Baal is going to be dead here without any resurrection to life. Baal is a dead god. Yahweh is a living God. You're going to see this concept of life, living, all throughout. Even that first verse where he says, the God of Israel, as the God of Israel lives, right? And specifically, we're going to see it's the word of God that brings life in, in this chapter. Uh, so let me ask this question. What verses from the Bible indicate that God's word is a source of life? <clears throat> What are some verses that indicate that? If you have a comment, raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. What are some verses from God's Word? It doesn't have to be from this chapter, but you know, just anywhere in God's Word that indicate God's Word is a source of life. All right, Will's got one. I hope we're just in a general context of the Bible because this is the only verse I can think of. Mm -hmm. Psalm 119, verse 105. Okay, a lamp to my feet, right? Yeah. Yeah, a light to my path, a lamp to my feet. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, light is often associated with life in Scripture. All right, Mary, she's got one here. <clears throat> In Psalm 1, it talks about the godly man and how he meditates in God's law. And then it says, and he shall be like uh, planted by the rivers of water, like a tree planted by the rivers of water and mm. bringeth forth fruit. Yeah, really good. Yeah, the, the God's word is like water, right? And we're like trees and we put our roots in that water and he, he gives us growth. Yeah, Randy? Yeah, and uh, in John, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and word was God. And then in verse four, in him was life. Yeah, really good. Yeah. And of course he's make, what is he doing there in John one? He's making a Genesis one parallel. And, and what did you see in Genesis one? Every time God spoke, life was born, right? Every, every act of creation is preceded by the phrase and God said. And so you're seeing his word give life even in Genesis one. Okay. He took your, sorry. <laughs> All right, Larry. Yeah, um, Psalm 107, um, fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all manner of food and they drew near to the gates of death. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered from their destructions. Nice. Yeah, so his word there is, is pictured as, you know, saving them from the prison of their sins, giving them spiritual life. Yeah, Amy? Um, John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He mm. who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and of course, there in John 6, he's referencing the wilderness wanderings, because he talks about how Moses sent the manna from heaven to sustain them in the wilderness. And Jesus is saying, I'm the real manna, right? I'm the true bread of life. Uh, and interestingly, in Deuteronomy chapter eight, uh, God says, I purposely let you guys be hungry in the wilderness because I wanted you to learn that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds 
from the mouth of God. You know, he was testing their faith because it's really easy to trust God to preserve your life when things are going really well for you. But he says, I, I put you guys in a perilous situation on the brink of death so that you would trust me that I would keep my promise to you, that I would actually deliver you. Uh, yeah, really good. Um, look in, uh, let's look at Deuteronomy 31. <clears throat> I wanted to show you this one because it's just so important to understand what's happening really in, in 1 Kings 17. Uh, so Moses, he reiterates the, the law to the people before they go into the land of Canaan. And at the end of the law, there's these sections called the blessings and the cursings. And God says, look, if you obey me, then you'll have all these amazing blessings. If you disobey me, that's just going to be a curse for you. And I like the way Moses puts it in Deuteronomy 31. Uh, I might have the wrong verse there. Give me one second. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy 30. Look at verse 15. Deuteronomy 30, verse 15 through 18. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but you are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land where you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. I, I just love how he puts that. After he gives them the law, he says, look, I've essentially just given you two choices. You want life or do you want death? If you want life, well, then you obey God, you love him and, and all that, and everything's going to go great. If you want death, well, then you go and serve other gods. Well, what do you see happening in 1 Kings 17? They've gone, they've served other gods, and now God brings <laughs> death because he says, all right, no rain for you from the heavens. Right. Um, yeah, lots of other good verses. Job 23, 12. I have not departed from the command of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Love that. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is inspired. Right? It's God breathed. And the breath of God, again, is a source of life in scripture. There's so many uh, examples. Anna, you have one? Hi. I could read the uh, verses before it, but... Uh, Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Mm. Yeah. yeah, very good. So let me ask, let me ask, well, and this was not on your sheet. I am catching you off guard with this. <clears throat> what are some practical applications from these verses for us? From all these verses about God's word being a, a source of life, <clears throat> what do you make of that from a practical perspective. <clears throat> All right, Mary's got one. <clears throat> well, definitely since life is in the word, to be in the word a lot and to cherish it and to develop a <clears throat> hunger for it. Yes. And to, you know, like, when kids get into different games, they learn all the, the terms and what they mean, and so it's almost another, another language that we learn, and uh, that's how it works. Right, yeah, yeah, you're making the word a priority in your life. And a lot of times we're really good about making physical provisions for our life. You know, we plan out our meals for the day to make sure we have enough groceries or whatever. And, you know, we put gas in the car and maybe we do some physical exercise to make sure we have energy. But are we putting the same spiritual preparation into the day? Are we starting with God's word at the beginning of the day? Because if not, we're not really alive. We're, we're walking around like we're alive. We don't really have God's spirit in us, God's breath in us, God's word uh, just flowing through us. I always, I always make this, I don't know if I've made this analogy publicly here before, but I've done it privately with groups and stuff. But at the end of The Matrix, <clears throat> when Neo uh, finds out that he's the one, you remember that scene where, if, if you've seen it, he sees everything in life through this binary code. So it's just all these like green, you know, flowing numbers as he sees it. I always think like, it'd be amazing to see the world like that through scripture that like scriptures are just, you know, coming down <laughs> everywhere I look and I'm just, I'm filtering all my sight, all my vision through 
uh, through God's word. Um, I think that's just such a cool goal uh, to have. Right, Stuart's got one here. <clears throat> but that only comes with giving the word priority in your life. Yeah, Stu. The, the thing that, that pops into mind, uh, mind when you ask this question is um, that if, uh, you know, life comes directly from God, it's, it's a gift and it should be respected and it should be um, coveted, you know, every day. You should, you should, every day is a new day and every day should be uh, fulfilled to its fullest, you know, and that's one of the, it's one of the practical applications I see on it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good. Yeah, God gave you life and you appreciate that life. You, you treat it as precious and you want to take care of that life that God gave you. And again, we often think about taking care of that life physically. And yeah, that's true, but we also need to take care of that life spiritually and, and grow like that tree. John's got one. I look at, hello? I look at it like um, we should be thankful for everything that God does for us and everything. You know, yeah. there's so much that he does for us. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and the word helps us appreciate, you know, so many more things that God does for us and gives us life. Also, uh, one more thing about this. Just be careful whose word you're trusting in, right? Like, it's so easy to just get latched on to, like, an Internet blogger or, like, a podcaster or something. You just follow this, this person and everything they say. You just, oh, this is so great. But it's like, are they centered on God's word, though? Like, are those things actually biblical? Are we putting God's word first before the word of other people? Uh, we really have to challenge ourselves on that. John? Um, okay, along that lines, <clears throat> could those someone who is looking for God also get in with a group, um, claim to be Bible-based, but the, the preacher um, or minister or whatever, um, his kind of twisting God's word a little bit because I have been told um, through a friend that we are actually worshiping at a wrong church because this is all a works base and it's you've heard it before oh, sure. you know and it's it's mischaracterization a yeah and it's Mockery. a group here in Orlando <laughs> but the thing is though I mean you know. They're working out of God's word, and I'm not saying that they're right, but it's like it's being twisted, sure. you know, um, and then it kind of goes, and when you kind of show things to them, sometimes it's almost like they're so enamored with the speaker, preacheritis kind of thing, that it's, it's almost like they're not willing to open up their ears, mm -hmm. even though they're reading in this, sure. it's like... Oh, but, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, and, and all of us can fall into that trap, right, and that danger, and we need to make sure that um, God, the only way God's word is going to be a source of life for us is if we actually treat it like God's word and we don't twist it and, you know, make it say things that it really doesn't say. Uh, so, yeah, that's all really good. And the reason I'm talking about this, because I, I want you to just watch the emphasis in this chapter on the fact that God's word is the source of life. So, for instance, just in verse 1 already, he says, it won't rain except by my word. Verse 2, it says, the word of the Lord came to Elijah and told him to hide himself. Verse 4, God sends his word to give a command to ravens, and those ravens go and give life to Elijah by giving him food. Verse 5, it says, Elijah went and did according to the word of the Lord. And this pattern is just going to repeat through this whole story that we're going to talk about this morning. So I'm just setting this, all this up in context. I also wanted to show you this map uh, because... Uh, Elijah is from uh, Gilead. Uh, Tishba is probably around here s somewhere, uh, but he goes to Samaria, which is the capital of Israel. That's where verse 1 takes place, where he confronts Ahab and tells him, look, there's going to be a drought. Uh, but then God commands Elijah to hide himself, to go east of the Jordan. Uh, it's hard to find the location of the brook Cherith. Uh, but many people think it is kind of around this area. So he leaves Samaria, and then later in our story, he's going to go all the way up here to Zarephath, which is the area of Phoenicia, and Sidon is where Jezebel is from. So that's where the widow of Zarephath is going to be from that we're going to read about, and that's where Jezebel is from. But what I want you to notice is God tells uh, Elijah after he's in Samaria, 
I want you to leave Israel. Go out of Israel to the east. Now, if you understand like patterns in scripture, when God leaves and goes out to the east, it's not a good thing. And Elijah is the representative of God's word. And so I believe this is a symbolic act of God saying, since my people have no interest in my word, I'm taking my word out of Israel's presence. So this drought, it's not just a drought of rain. It's a drought from God's word. And guess what that leaves? Death, because it's the source of life. So with all that background in mind, Let's read this story together, and then I'll open it up for discussion. And again, watch for concepts like God's word, life, living in contrast to death. Verse 8, then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please give me a little water in a jar that I may drink. As she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. And then Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go. Do as you have said, but make me a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me. And afterward, you may make one for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. Now it came about after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick. And his sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And so she said to Elijah, What do I have to do with you, O man of God? You have come, uh, you have come to me to bring my iniquity to remembrance and to put my son to death. And he said to her, Give me your son. Then he took him from her bosom and carried him up into the upper room where he was living and laid him on his own bed. And he called to the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, have you also brought calamity to the widow with whom I am staying by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, I pray you, let this child's life return to him. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the life of the child returned to him and he, re and he revived and Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house, gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son is alive. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. So, question, what lessons can we learn from the widow in Elijah's story? <clears throat> Herb? Well, my first response is ironic. God is using to sustain Elisha, as you well pointed out, the ravens bringing him food. The ravens were unclean. Mm -hmm. And so you know, and what would ravens bring? Like you said, who knows? But then he, he sends him to a widow. <laughs> widow and plenty are not particularly, don't normally go well in the same sentence. <laughs> True. Yeah. And this is a hard time anyway. And so he's going to a widow <laughs> who has very little to sustain him. And it's just, I think it's just evidence of God, like you said in his word, God is going to preserve him because he's not through with him yet. Yes. And God will can use a widow to, to make his word known or sustain his prophet, whatever it is. Yeah. That's what hit me. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's not the widow who sustains him. It's no. his obedience to God's word. <laughs> right. Yeah, really good. Randy? Okay. 
Yeah, and you know, I'm thinking about in life, a lot of times we have to say, you gotta connect the dots to make, to understand something. But dots don't always connect. And sometimes we make assumptions like, her son was fine until Elijah came there. Now he dies. So she's connecting those two things that aren't connectable. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of t it, it shows us how important it is to, to take God's word in context so we understand what's actually being said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. All right, Mary's got one. Larry, Larry in the back. Mary here, Chris. Here we go. All right, go ahead, Larry. Yeah. Um, Two times in chapter 17, the widow finds herself in the crucible of life. The first time, she's facing starvation. And in verse 14, it says, uh, it's the word of God, according to your word. And then she's in the crucible of life. She's lo she lost her son. He was dead. And in the last verse, uh, she says that the word of the Lord is in your mouth is truth. Mm -hmm. So she followed the word. Mm -hmm. And that's what saved her yeah. in the crucible of life. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and of course, what's amazing about this too is where she's from. She, she's, she's from Baal's territory. God sends her to Sidon, which is where Jezebel's from. This lady is not supposed to care about God. She's a Baal worshiper. But what has Baal done for her? She says, I'm about to die, literally. I'm, this is my son and I's last meal. Baal has not taken care of us. But God sends Elijah to her, and she is receptive to God's word, and God's own people are not. And you know this is the exact point Jesus made. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus comes to the synagogue. This is why Old Testament knowledge is so helpful. It opens your mind to understand the New Testament. Because Jesus comes to the synagogue in Luke 4, and he tells them, look, I'm the Messiah. You know, I'm the fulfillment of Isaiah 61. And they don't believe him. And then he said, you know what? Things haven't really changed because of this. He said, I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over the land. And yet... Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. You see that contrast? Tons of widows Elijah could have been sent to in Israel, but none of them would have been receptive to the word of God. Only this Gentile, this foreigner who should, who's a Baal worshiper, who should not be receptive at all to God's word, she had a more open heart than God's own people did to his word. Amazing. And you know how they reacted to Jesus to prove him wrong? They tried to throw him off a cliff, which only proved his point, right? Like, that made his point. Like, that's how hard your hearts are. Uh, and they wanted to prove him wrong. No, our hearts aren't hard, and we're going to kill you for saying that. Like, what? <laughs> You're just proving your hard heart. So, uh, really sad, uh, but a, a true thing that, that happens in Scripture. Uh, Mary? Well, I'll just pick up on what Larry said. She just never gave up. She didn't just mm -hmm. lie down and die. She was out gathering sticks, okay. and that's why she met Elijah. And mm -hmm. then she believed him enough to try what he said, and she opened her house to him because apparently he stayed with her or yeah. nearby and was fed by her, and she knew that he could help her with her son. Yeah, and think how hard it would be to, to obey him because he says, okay, yeah, I know you're, I know you're about to eat your last meal, but I want you to feed me first. <laughs> you know, make me some pancakes first. What are you talking about? I don't have enough. I can't even feed myself. How am I supposed to feed you and then myself? But she does that. She, she actually serves him first. And it takes tremendous faith to give when you have so little. Isn't it true most of us think like, oh, I'll, I'll start giving and being more generous when I make a ton of money. But right now, you know, I just don't have very much, and so I can't, I can't really be generous. No, you can. God wants you to be generous with what you have right now because, honestly, if you're not generous with what you have right now, when you get more, you, that won't change you. You, you will still be. <laughs> Dave Ramsey always says, more money only makes you more of who you are. And so if you're a jerk now, when you make hundreds of thousands more a year, you're going you're gonna to be even more of a jerk. <laughs> and that really is true. So 
no matter what you have, no matter how small it is, you can still be giving. You may not be able to give as much, obviously, as somebody with a ton of money, but you can still give sacrificially, and God is pleased with that. Bobby? I think what stuck out to me was uh, in verse 12, like when she, you know, when she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have no bread. Like she could have easily lied. She could have made something up, and this is somebody that's in a sin-filled you know, like world. And so like I think today, you, you never know who can influence you for God. It could be maybe not a member of the church or maybe somebody mm -hmm. new to the church. You never know their life experience or what they've been through yeah. that brought them to Christ. That's true. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you, you find people out in the world who have better hearts even than people in the church. And it's that same kind of thing that happened with the Jews and the Gentiles, you know, and we always have to be watchful for open hearts uh, and, and be willing even to, to learn lessons from others. Um, I would also say God often blesses the generous with more, right? Like she didn't just give this away and then God just let her die, right? He, he then gave her more and provided more for her as a blessing for her generosity. It's not a, it's not a health and wealth gospel like, hey, you write a check for $10,000, you are definitely going to get twenty in the mail next week. That's not necessarily going to happen, right? That might happen, but it, that, that's not really the promise in Scripture. It's just a principle that God, he sees the faith it takes to be generous in a sacrificial way, and he's going to reward that. It may not be in this life, but, but in the next, right? He'll remember, he'll remember that goodness. Proverbs 19, 17, one who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his good deed. This is especially true when it comes to helping God's servants. She's not just being generous to anyone. This is a man of God. This is a holy man of God that she's showing this hospitality to and generosity to. And Jesus said, whoever receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Whoever in the name of a disciple gives to these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, he shall not lose his reward. You know, many people right now, are, they're trying to kill Elijah. This widow is giving him life. God, God sees that. All right, anybody else have an have a answer on that one? Okay, I'll give you a couple more to think about. Uh, it takes faith to keep trusting God even when tragedy strikes. Right? She loses her son. She could have easily said, well, I don't want anything to do with this God. You know, he let my son die. And, uh, you know, Elijah, you just get away from me. You just leave my house. I don't, you're not welcome here anymore. You just go. She doesn't. She's confused. She's angry. She's, she's deeply, like, destroyed because she lost her son. But she still trusts Elijah, gives him her son. And he, he brings her to life. Uh, this also shows that God has the power even over death. I love how one writer put this. Uh, he said this, Here is the ultimate test of the Lord's authority. It is one thing to rescue people from the jaws of death, meaning, you know, from the drought, it's to keep people from dying. But can he do anything when death has clamped tight its jaws and swallowed the victim up, he can act across the border from Israel and Sidon. But is there a border that he ultimately cannot cross, a kingdom in which he has no power? When faced by Mot, the god of death, must Yahweh, like Baal, bow the knee? Elijah knows the answer, even if the woman does not. And so he prays, and the boy's life is restored. Even the underworld is not a place from which the Lord can be barred. Life can storm even death's strongest towers and rescue those imprisoned there. I just thought that was a really well stated emphasis on not even death can stop God right, from bringing life. He can, he can bring life out of death. All right, here's another question. Why do you think um, God is so giving but then also takes away? Uh, that verse in Job 1, 21, Job actually says that, like the Lord gives and, and, and the Lord takes away uh, when he lost everything. Well, here, you know, the Lord, <laughs> he helps this widow and, you know, he's given uh, her son all this food and all, and then her son dies. He takes her son away. What's with that? Why, why do you think God does that? We don't always know, right, all the answers why, but I think there are several possible reasons. All right, Will's got one, Retha's got one. <clears throat> first yeah go ahead Wilson um, he's the one in charge of everything on this earth and sometimes if um, sometimes 
he does things to good people like this because he also wants to test their faith, mm. their faith in him that he is the one. Yeah, really good. Yeah, I mean, two great points you made there. It helps remind us who's ultimately in control of, of every aspect of our life, that we, we think we have control, right, and we make plans, but we don't. It, it's ultimately under his charge, under his control. And two, yeah, sometimes it's just a way to test people's faith. That's exactly what he says in Deuteronomy 8 when he says to the Israelites, I took food away from you in the wilderness. I made you go hungry because I was testing to, to see if you would trust me to give you life. And he's testing this woman here as well. Yeah, Aretha. Often the most valuable, satisfying, and beneficial gifts come through experiences of suffering and loss. Okay, yeah, so sometimes suffering and heartache can bring you gifts um, that you didn't think of, like wisdom, like drawing closer to God, leaning on Him more. Stu? Uh, in this context, I think it's to, to kind of show that uh, death isn't the end of everything. It's not necessarily the end of all, you know, yeah. and to show the lesson that, you know, this, this, this time on, this time on earth is just temporary, mm -hmm. yes. you know, and, and remind you, you know, no matter how many blessings you have here, mm -hmm. you know, this is, this is just a, this is just a rest stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Life is fleeting. We're meant for eternity. Yeah. Mary. Right. And that goes perfectly with what I had is that in Ecclesiastes 9, 11, we read that the time and chance happen to everyone. This is a fallen world. Mm -hmm. And yes. if you go on and read in Ecclesiastes 12, it says, it just shows there that decline and loss and tragedy are just inevitable. Mm -hmm. and, and God is the only constant. Yes. And he wants us to know that. Yeah, that's really good. That's all very good. And if you think about it, this lady, she's kind of a new convert to Yahweh, right? And yet she's still suffering. Sometimes you notice that it's the new Christians that sometimes have the biggest attacks, you know, against them. Um, and I don't always know the answer why, other than Satan's trying to discourage them, God's trying to build them up in, in some way to discipline them. Maybe a person didn't become a Christian until much later in life, and so they need to suffer a lot to kind of catch up on all the learning and the wisdom, right, that they needed to do uh, earlier on in their life. Maybe, maybe that's part of it. Um, it may be, and I'm not saying this about this woman here, but it may be to discipline us, to show us that we're sinning and that we need to wake up and snap out of it because that's what he's doing in 1 Kings 17 in general with this drought. He's causing all these people to suffer so that they'll wake up and, and learn that he is the one true God. Does somebody else have a, have a mic? Okay, Steve. Uh, in many of the biblical stories, God, uh, even to those who are faithful, God makes them confront their own personal idols. Mm. And uh, I, I, this woman seems very devoted to her son. Uh, you know, in, in sieges in Jerusalem, Israelite godly women are eating their own children yeah. because they want to survive. They pick themselves over their children. Mm -hmm. This woman is saying, I'm going to feed him. He, he will eat with me no matter what. Mm -hmm. And then later on uh, in, in verse... Uh, where was it, uh, 18, uh, you've come to bring my iniquity to remembrance. You know, she's probably clinging to him because he reminds her of her, her lost husband. He, he prob she probably misses him, and, you know, this is my child. I love him. Mm -hmm. yeah. But perhaps this is to remind her that there, there is something beyond your child. You, you have to let him go. He is the most important thing to you. But yeah. this is a confrontation, you know, of, of, of her faith and of her like I said, in a sense, idolatry, her own personal mm -hmm. issue that she has to get over yeah. uh, in order to fully trust him. Yeah, and I think it's encouraging. Uh, I like what you said. I think it's encouraging. She doesn't turn to Baal here, right? She doesn't say, oh, Baal, bring my son back, you know, and I'll cut myself and all that other stuff that, you know, they do in the next chapter, right, in that, in that, con that Baal contest. Uh, she, she actually is still trusting the Lord. Yeah, really good. All right, let's go to this uh, last story here in 2 Kings 4. 2 Kings 4. Um, unfortunately, after Elijah's work, the people still really haven't repented. Uh, that, I mean, Baal worship has it's decreased some, but it, it's still a, a problem. And, and now Israel faces death, not from a drought, but from 
exterior enemies, the, the Moabites, the Syrians that God is going to send. And again, he promised that in the covenant. He said, like, if you disobey me, I'm going to raise up foreign armies. They're going to kill you, make your life miserable, take you into slavery, all that. So he already promised all that. Um, well, here you have Elisha step on the scene because Elijah passed his authority on to him. So many of the miracles that Elisha performs look exactly like, well, at least very similar to the things Elijah did to prove that he is Elijah's legitimate successor. All right, and that if you now listen to Elisha's word, you will have life, right? And actually, Elisha's name means God is salvation, right? So you listen to God's word now, I will save you. Uh, and here he's saving this woman's son from slavery. So let, let's look at this uh, seven verses here, and then we'll have four minutes or so for the rest of the class to just discuss this. Now, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophet, uh, this is 2 Kings 4.1, cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. And then he said, go and borrow vessels at large for yourself uh, from all your neighbors, even empty vessels. Do not get a few. And you shall go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour out into all these vessels. And you shall set aside what is full. So she went from him shut the door behind him and her sons, and they were bringing the vessels to her, and she poured. And when the vessels were full, she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. And he said to her, There's not one vessel more. And the oil stopped. And then she came and told the man of God. And he said, Go and sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and the rest of your sons can live on the rest. So what are some lessons here that we can learn from this story? This was harder. This is why I saved it to the end, because it's very, it's very similar to the other story. But maybe there are some other lessons that jump out at you. What do you think? <clears throat> While we're waiting, I'll give one. Herb's got one. Um, earthly status doesn't matter. Only faith in God matters. In the previous chapter, Elisha looks at the king and he says, I don't even want to look at you or talk to you because he was so sinful. Yet here's a widow. She's not a king. She has no earthly status at all, but she has faith in the Lord. And so Elisha does help her. Herb? Amen. And uh, another, <clears throat> what do you call it, lesson is she's, she's down to the end, and sometimes when we have tried it ourselves and we don't have anything, we, it's not working, we finally turn to God, and we're empty of anything, and God can fill us with his power and his word and his love and his faith. And she was a vessel that could be filled mm -hmm. with, you know, in the symbolism of the oil and so on. Yeah, really good. Lean on the Lord and he'll help you in ways that you can't help yourself. Mary's got one, Chris. When you said that about slavery, in the, in the other story it was life and death, but here it's slavery mm -hmm. and we can die a slow death in slavery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good. And, and I wonder if it's because these foreign nations are threatening them, right? When, when the foreign nations come in, they're going to kill them. And what are they going to do? They're going to enslave many of them. And so this could be a sign that God's saying, if you trust in me, I will keep you from slavery to these foreign nations. Now, that might be why that's placed here in this particular spot in the text. Uh, another one, even the righteous suffer hardship. The other story was a, was a pagan widow. This is a righteous woman. Her husband was one of the sons of the prophets, uh, which were basically a, a group of disciples that followed the prophets, that followed Elijah, followed Elisha. Um, but even his family, after he dies, is, is suffering hardship. Uh, also, serving God might make us look really weird. <laughs> it, it might be really odd for her to go around to all her neighbors and say, hey, can you get me all your empty vessels and just bring, you know, bring all your empty vessels out to me? And they're going to be like, why? Why do you want empty you know, vessels? That's really odd. But she doesn't care how she looks. She'll get whatever she needs to obey the word of the Lord and trust that the Lord will take care of her, even if other people don't understand you know, what she's doing. The ultimate lesson for us is that, is that God is the one true God. Right? There is no other. And he is the God of life and salvation. So let's keep trusting in his word, no matter the cost, and he'll always take care of his people. That's really the big picture of these two widows who are minor characters in the sense that they don't take up a whole lot of you know, pages in the scriptures, a lot of verses. But I think what we're learning through this subject and through this whole quarter is that there are no minor characters 
in God's kingdom. We all matter to him in our own ways. And so make the most of wherever you are in God's kingdom to serve and honor him. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your comments and thoughts. And uh, I've got questions for Wednesday night on the back table. And I'll also try to email those out on time.